Let's look at how to evaluate open source projects for compliance with your organization's policies and for supply chain risk. For this, we have a product called Open Source Select and a feature called Start Left Policies. We say start left because traditionally in organizations shifting left, the shift means adding more overhead to developers. Typically, you'll set up quality gates in your CI, which means that unless developers know your policies by heart, they'll import new dependencies, design solutions and write code around it, push it to the CI, only to have the CI job fail. This is obviously wasting a lot of time. With Debrick start left policies and select, you would instead just visit debrick.com slash select search for the dependency that you want to use and instantly see if it is compliant. To do this, let's go to select and search for a dependency I want to use. In my example, I'm looking for a dependency that allows me to get transcripts of Discord chats. Next, I'll select which repo I want to import the dependency to and I can immediately see that I will not be able to use this dependency in my repo because it has a GPL license. That saved me a lot of work. Clicking show all rules, I can also learn that the reason it's blocking me is that there is a rule in effect disallowing any dependencies that is licensed with a strong copyleft license. The search function in select not only searches for the exact match of the dependency you search for, but also tries to understand what type of functionality you're looking for. In this case, if we just scroll down on the page, we can find a similar looking dependency that is licensed under MIT and is all clear to use in the repo we want to use it in. Now that I know that I can use the dependency from a compliance perspective, how about addressing supply chain risk? The first thing to know is that the select search engine automatically protects users from typo squatted packages by pushing them far back in the search results. This is achieved by comparing the different popularity metrics to Brick has access to for components with similar names to determine which one is the genuine one. This of course benefits users by not having to worry about stumbling across a typo squatted package. The next thing to consider is the quality of the community supporting a project. An actively maintained project with a high quality community is less likely to have security issues or become so outdated that you need to switch it out down the road. Debrick measures the quality of a community with our open source health metrics, currently being popularity, contributors, and security. These metrics are built up in three layers. First, we have the top level layer, the general area that you want to measure in this example, the contributors. Then you have the second level uh, layer metrics, you can think about these as the questions that you need to ask in order to determine the top level, level metric. For example, for contributors, we ask how good, how experienced are the contributors? How efficient are they? Is it a diverse community of multiple contributors or is it one guy maintaining this project? How active are the contributors? Is there a core team that is committed to the project? And do contributors stay with the project for a long time or do they do one commit and then leave? Then the third layer is all of the individual data points or collections of data points that it all consists of. Each of the layers are aggregated upwards using a set of weights that are set by Debrict. Going back to our Discord's transcripts component, we can now analyze all of the different health scores, uh, digging deeper as we need to. Overall, it looks okay, but not great. But for the purposes that I'm using it, it's good enough. And so I feel comfortable importing this component. I purposefully chose to demo a smaller, lesser known component to highlight that we're able to create actionable metrics even for smaller projects. This is achievable since we have a flexible system uh, that when we cannot find all of the data points, it will find as many as it can and still achieve to set a metric score. It also helps that we keep a clone of the entirety of GitHub that is updated on an hourly basis, which allows us to have coverage for most of the repos and packages in the world. 
If we look at a more popular package like React, you can see that there are some more metrics and, and points and the data is generally a bit richer. I also want to highlight a few strong benefits to looking at metrics in this way, as opposed to looking at the data points, such as number of stars, directly. It allows you to get a bird's eye view of how good the communities are in these areas. For example, how good they are at dealing with security related issues, as opposed to just how many open vulnerabilities do they have. This is quite key, as I would much rather import a library that has a vulnerability, but has a track record of solving vulnerabilities in a timely manner, as opposed to importing one that has no vulnerabilities, but that historically has taken years to solve the ones that they did have. It is also much easier to compare components and actually do a fair comparison. To illustrate this, consider the question, how many stars is considered good for a project to have? The answer is that it depends. For a front-end framework, you will want tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of stars, as for React. Whereas for more niche research areas, a hundred might be excellent. In our metric-based system, we're able to account for this, making for fair comparisons. Lastly, and much because of the previous points, metric-based systems lends itself very well to set company-wide policies. Stating that a project must have a community health score above 50 makes more sense than saying it must have 300 plus stars, for the reasons mentioned above. Lastly, you can of course see the health risk of packages already existing in your repos. Uh, go into a repo, click the dependencies tab, and you will see a list of all dependencies in this repo, complete with the health scores of the dependency. Let's take a look at how to consume and analyze external S bombs using Debrict. I'm using an example GitHub account that's connected to Debrict using our native GitHub app. To initialize a scan of an external S bomb, I'll create a new repo and name it after the vendor and product. It could be named anything. This is simply to keep it apart from my existing repos. Then I'll upload the S bomb. And I'll commit the changes. Since we have the native GitHub app installation, Debrict will automatically pick up the, the changes made in the commit and begin a scan. The scan completed in 51 seconds. The consumed SBOM is treated as if it was any manifest file scanned by Debrict. All policy automation rules that apply to the repo are checked, and the outcomes of those rules are shown. Uh, like with any repo, those automation rules can be set to match your organization's risk appetite, in this case for a particular product from the vendor. The results are also shown in the UI, just as with any scan. All data that is normally shown for a manifest file will be shown uh, for the vendor scan. Uh, the exception is deeper remediation advice, since that requires a deeper context of the code than provided by an SPOM. In addition to the method shown, SBOMs can be manually uploaded through our user interface by dragging and dropping a file. They can also be uploaded through our CLI or through our APIs. We currently support ingesting Cyclone DX files, but SBADX files can be easily uh, translated to a Cyclone DX file by publicly available tools. Now let's look at how to generate an SBOM using Debrict. For one-off generation of SBOMs, it can be most easily done through our UI. In our report generator, you have a few different options for generating SBOMs. You can generate an SBOM for a single repository, for a group of repos, or globally for all of your repos. 
select the ones you want, click generate, and an email will be sent to you with the SBOM. The SBOM will be in the Cyclone DX format, which is the one we support, uh, since it is the most robust format for vulnerability data. The Cyclone DX files are easily converted to SPDFX if needed. SBOMs can also be generated through our CLI and our APIs. For recurring generation of SBOMs, you can configure your debricked scan GitHub action to include a step to generate an SBOM making SBOM generation a regular part of your CI workflows. In this example, we've set it up to save the SBOM as an artifact in the GitHub action. Our favorite thing is saving developers time and effort, and our remediation technology, called root fixes, is fantastic for just that. Let's have a look. Here's a vulnerability in the dependency HTTP proxy agent which is vulnerable in all versions smaller than 2.1.0. And so in order to fix the vulnerability, we must get HTTP proxy agent to at least version 2.1.0. The difficult part though, is that as we can see in this introduced through dependency tree, HTTP proxy agent is not a direct dependency. It is a transitive dependency to Nightwatch, which depends on HTTP proxy agent. That means that in all likelihood, if we try updating HTTP proxy agent here and here to version 2.1.0, the dependency tree will fail as upstream dependencies, pack proxy agent, proxy agent and Nightwatch will likely not be able to handle the large version jump. To solve this, we have created a graph database that contains all relationships of all dependencies in all versions for all of our supported languages. This allows us to query things like, give me the smallest version of Nightwatch that depends on the smallest possible version of HTTP prox agent that is at least version 2.1.0. The results are what we can see here in the UI, where we can see that we need to update Nightwatch from version 0.9.28 to version 1.0.4, and that will result in HTTP prox agent reaching version 2.1.0 downstream. This means that we have a few very powerful benefits. Uh, number one, it guarantees our users that we will not break their dependency trees. It also decreases the likelihood of breaking changes to your code as we follow the smallest, find the smallest possible update that solves the issue instead of just updating to the latest version. It also saves a lot of time compared to finding the smallest version possible manually, which involves digging through old versions of the repo on, on GitHub in order to find if it depends on the correct version of HTTP proxy agent. Lastly, it can also actually result in us being able to fix vulnerabilities where there is no official fix, being that we often discover that in a later version, it might be that Nightwatch doesn't need HTTP proxy agent anymore. And thus, updating to that later ver version of Nightwatch gets rid of the vulnerable dependency altogether. This technology is available both through the UI and through our fix pull requests, where we do these changes for you. 
and generally save developers a bunch of time. As mentioned, saving developers time and effort is a key part of our developer-focused mission. That's also why we've made a lot of key features completely free. 1,000 initial scans plus 100 scans per month are free forever, including our root fixes technology, automations, license scans, vulnerability scans, and much more. Furthermore, our select database is also completely free and doesn't even require a login to use. Simply go to thebrick.com select and start searching.